So I'm pleased to introduce this afternoon's speakers, Yael Bridge, class of 2005, and Morgan Spector, class of 2002. They're here to talk about The Big Scary S-Word, a film that they co-produced delves into the rich history of the American socialist movement and journeys with the people striving to build a socialist future today. Yael Bridge is an Emmy-nominated documentary filmmaker. Her film, The Big Scary S-Word, marks her directional debut. She previously produced Left on Purpose, winner of the Audience Award at the DOC NYC, New York City. Prior to that, she produced Saving Capitalism, starring former Secretary of Labor Robert Reich, which was nominated for an Emmy Award in Business and Economics. She holds an MFA in Documentary Film and Video from Stanford University and an MA in Media Studies from the New School. And she's joining us from Oakland. Morgan Spector is an actor with a long list of notable film credits. He starred in the HBO miniseries, The Plot Against America, the critically acclaimed Showtime series, Homeland, and will next be seen in the highly anticipated new series from Julian Fellows, HBO's The Gilded Age. Some of you may know Morgan from his Broadway debut in Gregory Mosher's Tony Award-winning revival of Arthur Miller's View from the Bridge. After graduating Reed, Morgan attended the American Conservatory Theater, and he is joining us from New York. Thank you so much for making the time to be here talk to us about your careers, and then your most recent work with the big scary S-word. I'm going to hand the floor over to you both. Thanks. Great. Thank you, uh, Olga, and thank you, uh, Reed, for everything <laughs> and for being able uh, to do this. I think one of the things that Morgan and I were excited about uh, or noticed along their trajectory of making this project was just actually how many readies ended up working on the project. Um, and I just wanted to say that up front because um, it was funny because it's not like we were all friends at Reed and it's just like that was how it happened. Um, there ended up being, I think, around four or five pretty critical people um, on the project who attended Reed. So I just want to upfront shout out those people right now. I am the director and producer, class of 05. Morgan was a producer on the project with me, class of 02. Sasha Lightman um, was class of 2016 and was a co-producer on the project. And actually she started working with me uh, right after graduating uh, from Reed. So just also a mini shout out to the Reed switchboard uh, for connecting us. And she's been working with me ever since she graduated. And also our DP, Eric Phillips Horse, would have been class of 04, but he left Reed after freshman year to Sarah Lawrence. Um, but I think of him as a Reedy in spirit. Um, and uh, and then we had several other people just sort of come in and out, including Danny Toman, who I think I saw at some point, um, who I feel like was a year behind me. Um, so anyway, just up fronting the fact that Reed was pretty involved uh, in, in the making of this film and just by virtue of sort of throwing us all together. Um, so I am gonna begin by saying, uh, Morgan, how did, how did we meet? Um, we met at John's wedding, didn't we? Speaking of Reedy's, yeah. <clears throat> um, a mutual friend of ours got married in Los Angeles. Uh, he had excellent barbecue. Um, I remember a lot of the speeches being inaudible, but that's me just being judgy, I guess. But it was very nice to meet you. And we uh, kind of hit it off and then stayed in touch. And my memory is that uh, when you were working on Left on Purpose, we were just sort of talking and we ended up, I ended up watching it and you and I ended up talking about the cut. And that sort of left us with, you know, I don't know, some desire to work together because we felt like we had sort of common overlapping uh, sensibilities. Um, yeah. Yeah. Wait, yeah, El, did you always want to make a movie about socialism? <laughs> was this your uh, dream growing up as a child? How did this my happen? My dream growing up. No, I didn't even know what socialism was until like a few years ago. <laughs> that was not, not a lifelong dream of mine. Um, we, yeah, so I think we met at John uh, Bauer's wedding class mm -hmm. of 04, maybe 05, um, and wanted to work together at some form in some capacity. Um, and this film kind of landed on your doorstep, I guess, and then you brought it to my doorstep. 
because uh, Morgan's a famous actor. And so um, people <laughs> were like coming to Morgan with ideas for documentaries. Um, and Morgan doesn't know anything about documentaries because he very true <laughs> an actor. Uh, and so he came to me and I uh, said, you know how to make documentaries, which is indeed true um, by virtue of all my graduate degrees, which I also feel is very reedy of me. Um, and so, um, so right, so someone came to you and we're like, we should do a film about socialism. And um, I was just finishing up Saving Capitalism. And so that seemed like sort of the next question, um, what comes after capitalism? And so, that was sort of how we got started on the on the film, which I think began um, with just a bunch of research, right? Can you want to talk a little bit about that process? Oh, what our what our research process was? Um, yeah, I mean, I think we were sort of, uh, you know, we were we were in touch with some of the Jacobin guys early on, and so we were sort of letting them. Uh, guide us and sort of throw things in our way. What's Jacobin? Oh, Jacobin uh, is a an, an online and I guess what are they? Are they quarterly in in print? Yeah, um, uh, an online magazine, primarily online magazine that was started in 2011 by Bhaskar Sankara and has sort of become like not just an American but an international sort of locus point for this renewed. Uh, democratic socialist movement, I think primarily in the US and the UK, uh, mostly in the last five years around the sort of campaigns, policies, and um, the sort of attended political organization around Bernie Sanders in the US and Jeremy Corbyn in the UK, uh, both of which have sort of crashed and burned at this point. Um, but, uh, but Jacobin remains, and I think it is still is sort of, um, the vital, most sort of, I mean, controversial in many ways, I think, but um, sort of most vital and central sort of voice of this movement. So we were connected to them early on and they were able to give us access to a lot of, a lot of people we could talk to who were thinking and writing about this stuff and about, and had been for a long time. Um, I think uh, Vivek Chibber was a kind of early, uh, early, conversation that we had we you know we met with him and spoke to him and he sort of gave us some guidance in terms of who we should read and what we should uh you know who we should talk to um you know i think i felt early on maybe this was a little bit of a reedy impulse that we should you know essentially dive into like every primary text of of socialism and communism and sort of read all the way through and at a certain point realized that there wasn't time for that it wasn't necessary it wasn't, that wasn't where the, the momentum of this movement was coming from. Um, and so I think we ended up feeling like it was more important to get a sense of what socialism meant to people who were excited about it right now in this moment. And obviously we needed to have a certain background. So I think we read around enough to feel like we were conversant with the history and the ideas, but I think we ended up, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like we ended up opting for a more like street level sort of discursive understanding of of the topic in terms of what went in the film yeah but i wouldn't sell us short i feel like we did no we did we did we read we books did, we did research yeah, yeah. yeah. what did we um, read on nickel's book we read we read the s word yeah so i think it began with maybe like a mini reading club yeah uh, that's right. right um and then is that I how every documentary starts with a mini reading club yeah, yeah. And, and typically I think a watching club, but one of the things we were dismayed and then I think invigorated by was there wasn't much of a watching club to be had because the, there is not like a 10 part Ken Burns PBS series on American socialism, um, which was surprising. And then also I think made us feel like we really had something to contribute. Um, I think also early on, one of the questions that, that I struggled with, that you engaged with, <laughs> with me on in that struggle, which is a question I think every documentary filmmaker should be regularly asking themselves is like, am I the right person to tell this story? Um, and that was, you know, 
because like you said, we were not socialists. We were not coming from like the hardcore left movement. And so was this not just like our history to tell, but like surely there's someone who is more familiar with these figures and this knowledge. We were just sort of doing a cursory reading. And then we're very lucky to be able to call like a lot of leading academics who just were like very happy to sit and talk to me for a few hours, um, which seemed insane, but also is to me like the best part of being a documentary filmmaker is mm -hmm. just that people, you can go and talk to basically anyone or that is maybe an exaggeration, but people are very generous. There are questions you can ask and people who will talk to you um, that wouldn't, like you can't just call up, you know, Jane McAlevey who's one of the most important like labor activists in America. You can't just call her and be like, hey, Jane, I got, I read your book and I have some questions. But if you're a documentary filmmaker, you get to do that. Um, and so we did a lot of informational interviews in the beginning, which was probably easier for me than reading all of their books. Uh, I was just like, hey, in two hours, can you please explain to me uh, what do you think is the most important thing that people should know about American socialism? Um, and I'd say that sort of, that was our dis that was sort of our research process. Um, and then um, let's see, what are the next questions we had um, written down? I don't know, but as you were speaking, I thought of another question I wanted to ask you, which was, who did you make? I mean, when you were thinking about, am I the right person to make this movie? What, how, how did you answer that question? And who were you making the movie for? Yeah, yeah, those were also, those, that was the other question. <laughs> we talked about a lot, who is this for? Um, well, right, so I decided, uh, or we decided that we could be the ones to, to make this film specifically because this was not our wheelhouse. And so um, the more that I think that you and I like delved into the left, we saw a lot of infighting and a lot of um, like focus on like really nitty gritty issues that I think if you were coming from that place, you would be lost in and the product that you would be making um, wouldn't be for a mass audience. And I think we were really geared right from early on of who our audience was going to be and those were like Bernie or Trump voters right we started right sort of after the 2016 primary and so we were looking at who were these Bernie Trump voters um and so like Republicans who might be open to these ideas at least and then also um like my parents right like these good these good boomer libs who are somehow still like convinced um, that Hillary Clinton was like the more reasonable candidate, even if their policies were much more in line with Bernie Sanders. And so I think we really were very focused with like the bound, the borders of the film of like, does this check one of these boxes? Uh, and if it doesn't, um, then that's not, they, you know, then that's just like a fun fact that will live in some other, I don't know, director's cut or something. I still fantasize about the kind of Frederick Wiseman style inside the DSA film, where you just get to see all these prickly personalities and all these people at war with each other over, you know, these like, whether doing people's traffic lights is good socialism or not, you know, like that kind of thing. I think that'd be a, just a fantastic film. Yeah, but I, I don't know Three who wants would to watch, watch that. Probably. I don't know, we can see, does anyone want to watch that movie <laughs> by raising up their hands? No, <laughs> one person <laughs> says, yes. There's a lot of meetings, right? I mean, I think that that is uh, clear. So there's a lot of meetings, a lot of talking, um, a lot of chanting. Um, and so, uh, yeah, different a different political project than maybe, than maybe mm -hmm. ours was. Um, Morgan, what did, what did you learn while making this film? Um, I, you know, it, it, it's been two things. <laughs> two things I learned while making this film. It took so long to make this film. I mean, I th I'd say, okay, one thing I learned that was, um, was really kind of a mind blower to me, was just how uh, impossible it is to make a documentary. Uh, the way that it's written, the way that it's assembled, you're sort of doing this process of following the material that you're acquiring, but also trying to shape it into something coherent when you don't really quite know what that's going to be in the end. It's this, I mean, there's this, I mean, a part of that process I wasn't really privy to because I think, you know, that was really your, in, in your capable hands, but uh, 
I, it seemed impossible to me that anything like a film ever emerged from that process. Um, and I still remain sort of shocked by it. And the other thing I would say is that when we started making this movie, there was so much, uh, there was so much energy behind this sort of Bernie thing. Like it was, you know, it was post 2016, everyone, you know, to the right of Trump or to the left of Trump was in total despair, but because of where we were sort of pointing our, focusing our attention, it was incredibly, I felt like there, I felt this sort of this, this incredible optimism about this um, growing movement. I mean, DSA, their membership went from 6,000 to actually close to 100,000. DSA, 000. Morgan? The Democratic Socialists of America, which was like this, this organization found uh, that founded basically by Michael Harrington. It sort of merged out of this merger between two old new left organizations. And it was originally designed to sort of function as the uh, ideological left wing of the Democratic Party that would try to pull that party to the left. Um, and it is now functioning sort of similarly, although I think no one wants to admit that they're engaging in that strategy anymore because I think people feel like that strategy is a failure. Um, and yeah, I mean, I do think there's, sorry, I'm like vaguely catching the chat. Yeah, I do think that there's, you know, there's a whole other conversation from Morgan. I'm gonna, we'll talk, we can talk about that later. Um, but it seemed incredibly hopeful at the time. And I think I thought, uh, oh, this is this, in, you know, we're catching this incredible moment. And now we've seen what is probably like an inevitable retrenchment against it and the sort of defeat of that moment. And yet a lot of these ideas have become, are so popular demonstrably that they've been incorporated even into a fairly like, you know, at least partially into this fairly right-wing uh, president's, you know, democratic president's platform. So I don't know what I'm saying I learned. I guess I learned that um, this process of change is, I think, no matter, you know, no matter how excited people get about it, how much like popular energy is behind it, um, there's, a, there's a lot of organizational work that I don't know that we know how to do anymore as a kind of, as a, as a society that needs to be done in order to bring about anything like what we were sort of hoping for at the beginning of this process. But anyway, um, what about you? What did you learn? Oof. Uh, well, I mean, I was kind of joking, but not really like socialism really wasn't a word that I was all too familiar with. It wasn't part of my education, uh, certainly as a, psych major at Reed, it did not um, come up. Uh, so, you know, I think the whole process of um, all the things that are covered in the film were, were all quite new to me. And then certainly the process of collaboration and, and partnership in every film is its own um, beast um, with different ethical, um, quandaries and stuff along the way. I think, you know, one of the harder parts of the film was sort of, to your point, how much socialism was changing while we were making it. So when we began uh, the Democratic Socialists of America, which I'm just using as a benchmark for how popular socialism was, writ is, was whatever writ large in the country had around 3000 members. Um, and now it has upwards of 100,000. So it was just like when we started kind of fringe, it felt fringe, which was weird because Bernie Sanders was so popular. Um, why would he be so popular? But the word that he used to describe his political philosophy felt fringe. And that just doesn't feel the case to me at all. Like it's not stigmatizing. You see a lot of people in the Democratic Party even just like rushing to the left, trying to call themselves a socialist, trying to get these endorsements, um, which, which wasn't happening at the time. And so you know, I think actually to our credit, we were very cautious to be not chasing the film, chasing the news while we were making the film, like really trying to create something that was more historically grounded and that did have something larger to say um, that would be more evergreen. Um, but, um, but it was hard, I think, uh, to do that. Um, let's see. The, so we talked like a little bit, I guess, about the process of making the film and things that we 
learned. I think we wanted to also talk a little bit about Reed um, and our background there. And then I'm actually kind of eager to have a conversation um, and see what questions people are having. I see some, some strong opinions in the chat that I'm excited to, to delve into. Um, and then I also have an anecdote about Eric Goner that I want to tell Jackie Dirks. Um, so um, uh, Morgan, uh, mm -hmm. very generally, how did Reed inform or shape your life, <laughs> if it did? Um, yeah, no, I think it did. Uh... <laughs> Well, I mean, you're a movie star, which isn't really a major that you- I'm have. totally not that. <laughs> like, I'm definitely a working actor and I definitely benefit actor. from like uh, the content glut that we're living in at the moment. But I would, I would say that I'm definitely not a movie star. Um, but I will say that, you know, I think um, as an actor, as a theater artist, I definitely formed my sort of sensibility at Reed. Um, you know, I think one of the things we all sort of talked about at the, t at the time that I was there, and I think it's different. I, my sense is that it's different now. I actually haven't been back. Um, maybe a little different. I mean, but that we had a ton of latitude. We were sort of left alone to sort of mess around and do what we wanted um, in that big, beautiful space. And I think we had a lot of support in that. I'm not saying we were abandoned to that project. Uh, I'm just saying, you know, there was a lot of sort of freedom to be an interest in being experimental. Uh, and that was a sort of, so I think, I mean, honestly, it hasn't been like the work I've done. I got to New York thinking I was going to, I was like coming there with my love of, you know, UNESCO and Beckett and all this like absurdist theater. And I was going to find, you know, New York City in the 80s and, you know, what remained of that uh, when I moved to New York in 2006 was, Kind of exclusive and clicky and hard to get into um and then also didn't pay you any money so like the the thing that you win if you get to be part of the downtown scene is like i don't know uh you know you get some cred i guess but you also get to starve so it it was it didn't seem uh, tenable to me and anyway that's got nothing to do with anything but I would say Reed is a place I definitely, well, I don't know. What about you? What did, what, how did, what did Reed? Wait, no, I want to like, when you, cause you were a, a theater conversation. major. What? You were a theater major. So is that, yeah, I was a theater, like you, were, theater you always wanted to be an, an actor in some. No, I no. came to Reed and I was like, oh, I'm going to be an academic. I mean, I guess, okay. That's, I was like, I'm going to be a, a, a Reed English. I'm going to, you know, do uh you know, be like a teacher somewhere or something like that. And then I sort of, you know, sort of got exposed to, like academic writing on a serious level. And it was kind of like, I don't want to do this. This is not, this is not for me. And just ended up just being in plays constantly and loving that. And then finally admitting to myself that that's what I wanted to do basically. So I guess I felt like I sort of begrudgingly found what I, the direction for my life at Reed, which is a fairly serious influence. Yeah, what about you? Um, how did Reed shape what you, I do? Your, your whole existence. <laughs> Yeah. my everything uh -huh. um well i i had such a good time at rate i look back on it for sure i think as many people do on their college years um and those friendships and relationships um i think yeah i was a psych major i thought i wanted to be a psychologist um and then like my thesis really um really messed me up uh just it, i studied um what was it on? I, it was about like decision making and basically just like I took it really seriously. And then afterwards I was really paralyzed and I felt like I couldn't make a decision because now I knew that humans weren't rational beings and uh, had to go, you know, sit on a beach in South Africa for a long time <laughs> and then like be away from everything, which was easier because there wasn't like so much internet or cell phones and stuff that you could really be, be removed. Um, so, you know, I mean, not not nearly as one to one as I think is, is your experience at Reed might have might have been. Um, I wanted to to study photography at Reed, and I remember there was like a you had to take a art like a studio art class first um, before you could get into the advanced photography classes. And I went there the first day, and it was like a blank canvas, and they just said like draw something, and then I just like exited the back door. Like I was like, that is not. <laughs> 
<laughs> like I am not able to do that. Uh, I consider myself creative and artistic, but really it is like through a camera lens. Um, it is not, um, I can comment on other, on other things that are around. I cannot create my own thing, um, deep anxiety. So, so, so yeah, so I don't know, but certainly I think, you know, and we talked about this while we were making it, how much of sort of wanting to engage with, um, with primary sources, with information constantly like questioning um, and being critical uh, of, of everything, I think was something that was definitely like fostered at Reed that led us to be, um, I would say successful uh, at, at this project. Um, yeah, I mean, at the very least it, it like, I think people took us seriously. They were like, oh, some readies, <laughs> okay, they know, we'll talk to them. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, um, I don't know. There was one other question we had. Maybe not really. There are some questions that people submitted before. Olga, should we jump to those? Should I look sure. in the chat? Sure, if, do you wanna look at the document that I was putting together and pull questions? Mm -hmm. We can see there, okay. Yeah, great, okay. Um, First question is, how did you get financing for the film? We didn't. <laughs> uh, documentary is horrible. Um, I guess all film financing can be tricky. The landscape is shifting um, all the time, especially now in the last five, 10 years with, with streaming services. I was just um, moderating a Zoom call actually earlier this morning with the Documentary Producers Alliance talking about the pending Yahtzee strike and how horrible funding is and how the streaming services have just um, completely upended everything and sort of to the focus of exploiting labor somehow even more uh, than they were when we were living under big, big Hollywood studios. Um, so financing for documentary, uh, sorry, tangent specifically is right. You are fundraising while you are in production for the most part, unless you are um, independently wealthy or um, one of the very few people that get um, like an upfront funding from Netflix or some of these other major streaming services. Which, to be honest, I naively really thought that we would be. My last film, Saving Capitalism, was a Netflix original. And we did have all that that funding, um, and so I just thought it seemed inevitable. The year we started, socialism was the most googled word um, on Google, and so it just felt like clickbait. Like, duh, if there was a movie out there that answered what is socialism, like you don't have to ideologically be down with socialism, but I assumed that your capitalist drive would allow you to see there was some profit to be made from that. Um, and that was not, not the case. <laughs> I was wrong. Um, and we were fundraising. We did two Kickstarters and we raised around $300,000 from that. Um, but the budgets for these films, I mean, I would say something that I'm very proud of is on this project, we paid ev everyone and um, we didn't have any unpaid interns. We didn't have anyone doing transcription or whatever on other projects that might be unpaid. Um, and so that meant that the budget was quite, was quite high. Um, and so, um, so it was rough. It was a lot of, a lot of work going into those Kickstarters and individual, um, pursuing individual donors and stuff um, up front. Um, let's see. Oh, does the film talk about the fear, rational or not, of socialism? I heard someone say you discuss the renewed enthusiasm. What do you think, Morgan? Um, yeah, I mean, I think we sort of, we don't really go at uh, a, um, the, we decided sort of not, you know, there are a lot of people who are gonna just sort of say socialism equals Venezuela equals gulags and, you know, their brain turns off and I think sort of trying to directly engage uh, with that perspective maybe isn't as productive as, a, as another more oblique approach, which I think we opted for, which is just to say, you know, this is a fairly, uh, a, what, what this particular version of socialism is advocating, what this young movement is advocating, and actually what American socialists have mostly advocated um, are 
fairly, uh, you know, fairly reasonable policies. You know, I think in, in our film, there's a moment where you, you there's, a, there's a segment on um, uh, North Dakota's public bank. And there's a, there's a quote where, you know, they, they, I forget whether it's the, the bank guy or the historian you interviewed, but uh, the line is something like, you know, uh, North Dakotans didn't rally to ideological socialism, they rallied to a practical solution to a problem. Um, and I think what we try to show in the film is that a lot of the time uh, socialism in America has meant practical solutions to the problems of working people. And that if you find that, and that our hope was, if you're one of those people who think socialism is gulags, that you'll sort of look at this and, and it'll be a little bit defanged for you. And, I, you know, I, that was our, I think that was our sort of tactic. It wasn't necessarily go directly at persuading people that, you know, socialism is nothing to be afraid of. Yeah. Um, uh, what do you wish you had explored in the documentary that you weren't able to fit in? Hmm. There's so much. We talked a lot about trying to make this a mini series because it felt like this really ought to be like a six part series or something. There's so much to cover, um, but we thought it was more important for it to come out sooner than for us to, to spend another three, four years working on it. Um, I don't know if that was the right decision. But I, the, it's too late one, now. One of the things that I wish we'd talked about was um, that idea of um, like Matt Brunig's like, the proposal to uh, democratize like all of finance is set by creating a sovereign wealth fund that sort of everybody is gradually, um, you know, that basically democratize the entire market over a period of years where everybody ultimately gets sort of paid out like a, a UBI style dividend from that wealth fund. And you end up sort of, you know, having collective ownership over the entire market, more or less. Uh, I thought that, I think it's just a very, you know, you know, our, our form of capitalism is very far removed from sort of factory floor organizing capitalism in some ways. And I think that was like an, an aspect of, uh, an aspect of how to, how to organize opposition to our current form of capitalism that we didn't get to talk about, but I don't, I, you know, there wasn't really a, a way to get into it without it being incredibly dry and boring, I don't think. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm just gonna keep on going down these questions since I assume you're not in front of the document. Um, how to confront parents who are triggered by the word socialism? Since you're looking at the document, it's not fair. I'll just end up answering all the questions. So Yael, how, how would you tell people to confront their parents who are triggered by the word socialism? Um, well, I confronted my parents who were triggered by the word socialism. Um, and, I, and I'm right, like I said, I think that was that was definitely one of the, one of the audiences for the for this film was like to to have something that's that is that is fairly anodyne which I think our film at least that was our goal was for it not to be polemical and not to be um, dogmatic but just letting socialists say what they mean when they say they want socialism which isn't to say that they all agree with each other um, you know, and or that historically, what that word meant historically is what what people mean today. But if you, you can have socialists today say this is what we we want, um, like that is a very powerful tool. Um, and to not let Fox or even MSNBC try and create some kind of boogeyman about what people want when they say it, and then you can get past that and say, okay, I might not be a socialist, but I understand what you're advocating for, which I guess is what you were saying about trying to defang the, defang the word socialism. Um, and that then we can have more policy conversations without having to write off someone whole hog just because that's a, a brand that they have embraced. Um, let's see, I'm gonna look in the chat now because I feel like there was some stuff in here. Um, Blah, blah, blah. Do we have a working definition of socialism, Morgan? Someone asked if we have a definition of socialism. Um, you know, one that sort of comes up again and again, I would say is like um, the expansion of democracy uh, in every sort of sphere of life, including the workplace. Um, I think that's, I think that would encompass like Richard Wolff's sort of drive for 
uh, co-ops and the sort of, I don't know, I think maybe even, I think that's even sort of similar to what, how Bosker has described, described it, you know, that essentially you're saying that you shouldn't, uh, you know, once you cross the threshold of your job, um, enter a space that is, you know, authoritarian and you just accept that, that's, um, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I would say from, I mean, taking a cue from what you were just saying about taking these socialists at their word. And I do think that, you know, what John Nichols says, like, you know, socialism is geographically and historically distinct wherever it emerges. It, you know, it is defined by the people who are organized for organizing for it and calling for it. And that is as it should be. We should not say, oh, well, this is not you know, Rosa Luxemburg socialism. So it's not socialism. We should say, hey, this is, you know, you are you working class people saying this is what socialism is? Okay, that's what it is. And I think right now what it is in America today is this basic call to decommodify like big segments of our economy, um, sort of as many as we can. Uh, but particularly, I think the, the, the areas where the economy already tends toward monopoly um, and or where the market so clearly fails people in a way that is, you know, sort of catastrophic, like healthcare, uh, that it becomes, you know, sort of irrational to maintain a market-based system. And yeah, I mean, I would say right now, I mean, we could, you know, I do think that maybe DSA is more of like a, you know, social democratic organization in a sort of uh, classical sense, but I do think primarily the drive right now is for that kind of decommodification and for the sort of uh, regeneration of the public sphere um, operating in the interests of, you know, broadly in the interests of all. Is that, does that sound, I don't know that that was pithy, but does that sound like true-ish to you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, there are so many good questions in here. What do you tell people who point to Venezuela and say that socialism does not work? I think we already did that. Yeah, <laughs> someone's saying yes, <laughs> we did already do that. Um, can you talk about what happened to socialism around World War One? World um, War II? Can you? No. no. Yeah, this was sort of uh, yeah, like you know, depended on who we were talking to and what they what they ended up talking about. Um, I mean, here, yeah. I mean, I'm not an expert. I mean, I think I mean, it was a crisis for the it was a crisis for international socialism. You know, people wanted to oppose the war. People, I think, like European socialists sort of uh, broke with the overall international consensus to support the war. And that was enormously destructive and had really lasting effects for like the um, sort of movement overall. That's that's my sense. Does that ring true for you? Yeah. Yeah. And I would just also say, like, we um, it's just like a funny experience in general, because I very much am a filmmaker and that is my training. And then by virtue um, of making this film, we are regularly asked uh, to be political pundits, which we can be, because I think that's what we do in our spare time. Um, but that's just sort of casually and not in any official capacity. So I always get very nervous, though I've gotten a little more comfortable since we've been doing these, um, that you know these socialists are gonna come after us and say like, oh, you, you said it wrong. Um, but so far we've like, I think skated okay. There's not like too much angry Twitter. Um, it's hard going. to be accountable. Mm -mm. Um, how much did you have to attend to separating the S word from the C word? Um, yeah, I think we were, we like tried pretty intentionally just to stick to the word socialism and not get too bogged down with communism, which I, which is hard to do when you're looking, um, at, at history specifically as to what Morgan was saying, like how people define themselves like sort of shifted. Um, and it's not the same as it like what you would call yourself if you called yourself a socialist now doesn't necessarily mean that you would have called yourself a socialist historically. And there was, I think a lot more fluidity um, around those radical movements, um, including communism and anarchism. Um, and so we just tried to stick with socialism because that felt more coherent than trying as a as a narrative container for the for the film. Um, I I thought that if we included communism and all, we would just sort of lose lose our our bearing a little bit, lose our compass. Um, does that sound right to you? 
Morgan Navarre. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, thanks, Annie. I'm glad <laughs> your son likes the film. Um, we are hoping, actually, we have an educational distributor. I mean, so the film, we had its theatrical launch. It came out during COVID, which is a thing we didn't talk about was how much COVID really derailed um, this film, which was quite a bit. Um, and we came out theatrically Labor Day weekend. And um, you can rent it on iTunes and Apple Plus and all those major places. Um, and we're also working um, with an educational distributor to be able to get it into libraries and schools um, and, a, and a curriculum as well. Because um, I think that um, I'm sure like my political understanding of this country would be very different if I had seen a film like this when I was younger. Um, it's just like history that I just did not didn't really know, except I would say about reconstruction. And so I wanted to say we were really excited. We got to do this very long interview with Eric Foner, um, who was very generous. It was also one of, I think like the first interview that we did. So it was incredibly comprehensive because we didn't really know what we were looking for yet. So I was asking him a million things. I think he sat for like three hours or something exhaustive, which was which was very generous. And then he has you know, his whole bookshelf of all of his books. And he's like, oh yeah, I'm gonna give you a book. And then of course he gives me reconstruction and signs it. And I was like, that's the only one I have. <laughs> Uh, because it was a sign when I took 19th century American history with Jackie Dirks. So now I have two copies um, of that book. So um, anyway, are there any, um, I'm just looking over. I don't think Zoomers are scared of the word at all, which, yeah. Do you want to talk more about generational observations that we made about socialism in this film? Um, yeah, I mean, I just, you know, statistically that's true. Like and basically anyone under 40 has no reservations whatsoever about, uh, about, uh, this, about the word, about these ideas. I mean, I think, you know, in our film, Lee Carter says whatever he was, you know, he was three or something when the Berlin wall came down, the cold war doesn't mean anything to him. Um, I think even for people who have a more informed view of the cold war, you sort of look at it now. And it seems, um, you know, it, it maybe doesn't seem like the, uh, you know, the legitimate clash of civilizations that it seemed like to people who lived through it. It seems more like, um, you know, this kind of uh, just sort of form of imperialism or colonialism by other means, uh, you know, sort of perpetrated by the United States in the aftermath of the sort of collapse of the pre-World War II global order. Um, and so you look at it, you sort of look at it now and think, well, that was just unnecessary. And, you know, whatever the sort of ideological, supposed ideological conflicts that came out of that, you know, maybe we didn't have like a great conception of that, uh, even at that time. And so maybe it's, you know, better that we just go forward at this point um, with, with what we, you know, the, the solutions to problems as we, as we see them. Um, so yes, I think for the, for us, for younger people, that's sort of what it feels like. I think for older people, yeah. I mean, I think of my father, who's like very, uh, um, very sort of anti-authoritarian, you know, very like, you know, uh, sees all the sort of corporate malfeasance, you know, sees sort of money being, uh, this massive corrupting influence in politics. And yet I don't think would call himself a Marxist or a socialist or a communist by any stretch. Um, and I, it's just very confusing. I think it is just sort of the legacy of, you know, just being bathed in propaganda for your entire life. Yeah. I don't know, what do you? Yeah, well, I, I mean, we were talking a little bit earlier this morning just about like activism on Reed when we were at Reed, which was the early aughts. And, um, you know, it was very distinctive for me, right, being on campus freshman year for 9-11 for and then just remember, but I wasn't, um, I, I dated some activists, but I was not uh, going to any of their meetings um, or, or agreeing with their, <laughs> with their politics necessarily. But I, I think now, right, like it is the majority of people under 40 who identify as socialists and not as capitalists. And I know that that is, um, like we are in communication with the Reed student, um, 
uh, DSA chapter, and they're trying to organize a screening of the film on campus in early November. And I wonder if it's possible to engage, like if people who are on campus now, because it looks like maybe there's some, I don't know, if, is there anyone who can sort of speak to what that is on campus and, and what they're able to see with younger generation in terms of in terms of that word or those ideas at all? I mean, maybe not. I don't know if that is a thing anyone wants to do. No. I, I just couldn't speak to it, unfortunately. I'm too removed because I'm not student facing. I don't know. Uh, yeah, Al, do you want do you want to speak to that question about the Catholic Church? I was just thinking of uh, like Elizabeth Brunig and you know where there was that moment where we were going to sort of try to try to get into that, but we sort of yeah, I mean, that's a part we didn't end up getting to touch on in the film is the relationship with religion and and socialism um because that was like a big part of the of the Oklahoma socialists, right? the uh, historically, the Oklahoma socialists were were um, socialists because they thought um, Jesus was a socialist, and that was that was the way of practicing their um, religion. But in terms of, I don't know, does the Catholic Church have anything to offer regarding socialism? Probably. I, I know Liz Brunick write, writes a lot about that. Um, as Francis a has been sort of openly anti-capitalist in some ways, hasn't he? I think. Who I mean, has? Pope Francis. Yeah, I don't. I don't like really using that language, or just someone's nodding yes. He has been so yeah i mean i wouldn't say that he's called himself a socialist but he you know he definitely has been uh he's very been very outspoken about the sort of the profit mode of being you know uh, i think and corporate power being you know very very outsized compared to mm -hmm. what we need to do for the environment and stuff like that for for poor people yeah, yeah. um okay someone is asking about how COVID impacted the film and I can say we were supposed to premiere um, in April, I think of 2020 or May. That was our, our premiere date at a festival um, up in Canada and, that, and that, um, that obviously canceled. It was actually really um, like all the festivals in the beginning of the festival lineup, they all canceled um, for the, like six months or so. And then they ended up switching to a hybrid model. Um, and then it felt really clear to us that COVID was really laying bare a lot of the pitfalls of, of capitalism and, the, and who was being left behind um, and who was making a lot of money. Um, and so we were able to go out and just uh, do a little bit more shooting to include a section about Medicare for All um, with a nurse um, who works in a public hospital just a few miles from my house. We were able to include just a little bit about that in the film. Um, but in terms of the film release, like it's just been it's very hard to release a film right now because um, no one is going to movie theaters. And I think everyone, uh, us aside, are very zoomed out. Um, and um, it's just, there's not, there's not a huge appetite, I think, for, for films like this at this particular moment. So when we came out in movie theaters, we ended up pulling most of them. We played in, in LA and then pulled the rest um, for in-person events just a month ago. So I went down to LA, double feature with Dune. Um, I went down to LA and well, and, and you were there, right? And there were like 20 people in the in this beautiful theater and 10 of them were us. So that was sad. <laughs> um, and, and, and that happened two nights in a row. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so it's been it's been tricky. Um, one of these other questions that I am excited about for readers who wanted to get into film or documentaries, what's an avenue or two to take in that direction? I don't know, Morgan, you can speak to film and then I can speak to documentary. Um, yeah, you know, I don't know. I think um, for me as an act, you know, primarily trying to get into the acting side of things, like I chose to go through a very kind of institutional route. Like I went to get an MFA with the with the knowledge that if I finished my my MFA, I would get my equity card and I would pro I would get like an opportunity to get an agent, uh, which I was lucky enough to get coming out of grad school. Um, and those things are otherwise very hard to do. Like if you're trying to get your equity card 
doing just sort of jobbing regional gigs. Uh, and, you know, that is very, tr it's very tricky. People do it. Um, and people also get agents without uh, going to school. But for me, that was the only way I could sort of figure to do it. Uh, I think now though, I don't know, it's like, you know, everybody, maybe the thing to do is start a podcast or like a YouTube vlog or just start making your own content because I feel like, uh, you know, the world is shifting so quickly. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not totally sure what the, what the best route is, but for me as an actor, I needed all of that support to sort of get, you know, uh, to sort of take an on-ramp into the, into the business, um, so that I could actually start auditioning for real jobs and not sort of existing on the margins. Cause I think that would have been really impossible for me to do basically. I don't know about you. Yeah, same. Oh, my daughter is, hold on one second. <laughs> Um, I'm just gonna uh, address that. There, there are two things in the in the chat that I, uh, I I would I don't think either of us are saying that like everyone under forty like a hundred percent of people are out and out socialists. Um, it's just that majorities of people under forty have been a favor have a favorable opinion of socialism as opposed to capitalism. That still means that you have you know 40, 40 plus percent of people um, who. Are, might be very comfortable with, you know, I don't know, executing Bernie Sanders. I don't know what, you know, people's opinions are, but I'm not trying to say that, I'm not trying to say that like generate the millennials and Zoomers are going to save the world. I mean, they kind of have to, but I'm not saying they necessarily will. Uh, it's just that they don't, they're not saddled with a lot of the sort of Cold War baggage in the same way. And also uh, podcasts definitely do uh, make money. Um, there are people out there there are podcasts out there that are pulling in like high six figure, like low six figures monthly. Uh, I mean, I think those are obviously exceptions, but you can you can make a living, yeah. Yeah, someone pointed to Dan Denver early, early right. on. Um, That's all he does, right? For money, he does does the podcast. He does his podcast, yeah, which I was on just last week. Um, so you guys can take a listen to that if you want to hear more of me talking about this film. Um, I also took a very traditional route to, to, to going into film, I think as you did, like I, it was maybe more circuitous. I did other things beforehand, but I did go and get my MA in media studies and then my MFA in documentary film. I think my, and then, so I'm like very, very trained um, in that. And it's still incredibly, hard, the funding isn't there. It is um, like all philanthropy and grant based. And so you have to write a lot of grants, which is not my strength. Um, and I don't know. So like what advice I would give people, I think uh, like, I don't know, actually I was just talking with, with Danny earlier about like, is there a way to start like a read film something, um, which I don't know, whether you're the one to talk to or someone at career services, because it is like very specific, I think, and not, it's not like a major, it's not like a thing you can really take a class in. I think I took um, uh, like a Soviet cinema class at Reed, which was like the only film class that was offered when I was there. I think later, I think um, there was Rebecca Gordon who taught a film theory class, but I was already gone and I missed it. Um, so, you know, there's not necessarily the training at re in craft specifically, um, but the the training intellectually and, and the thinking process um, is like so perfect for documentary film that I, I feel like I would love to be able to help. Um, I don't know if there's a way for us to to connect and network, I think that would be very cool. Um, so I don't know, I feel like we're budding on our time. Are there any other questions? I'm looking over the thing. Oh, are there other questions that we should be addressing or answering? There's been a flurry of comments and, and conversation happening in the chat, which I think is great. Um, not, they're not all questions. Um, Okay. What is your own view of source? This, I, I don't know. Morgan, do you want, how, uh, let's see. Which one? So much change in America seems to be impeded by organized religion. How do we change things given this position? 
Yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah. I wouldn't say I have a great answer for that. I had sort of ended up thinking about that a lot toward the end of our process, just realizing like, oh yeah, this is still a major force in American life and people just believe things. And it, you know, how are you gonna, I don't know. I, I think, you know, actually piggybacking on something I see Allison saying in the chat, like, I think the, you know, the goal of a left movement has to be, you know, you, you improve people's material conditions, you improve people's lives on a material basis and, I think, you know, whatever their closely held beliefs, uh, they can will end up seeing that that the movement that actually achieves that for them is the movement that they should support and be part of. And I, I think, you know, that's the, I don't know, that's that's the sort of situation in which we find ourselves right now politically. I think a lot of people, religious, non-religious, but a lot of people who are working class have sort of gotten used to the fact that for decades, neither political party has actually done that much for them materially. And so a lot of people who would need to be part of a successful working class coalition are totally checked out of, of political life. And I think we end up, we find ourselves in, a, there's a little bit of a catch 22 right now where in order to get those people back into political life, you're gonna have to deliver for them. But in order to deliver for them, you need them in your coalition electorally. And so I don't know how we get past that sort of impasse without a ton of um, a ton of really good organizing. So I don't know, maybe that's what DSA is for in the end. Uh, yeah. Cool. I feel like we we uh, we we answered all the questions. <laughs> No more questions about American socialism. <laughs> it's honestly, very nerve wracking appearing in front of all of you August readies. <laughs> uh, yeah. All right, anyway. Nice to see all of your faces. Yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciated this opportunity um, to Olga and, and Reed for organizing and facilitating this. Um, you can find the film at socialismmovie.com and then you could also just email us if you have any questions uh, directly about it.